I'm feeling kind of temporary about myself at the moment. Those lines spoken by Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman have been resounding in my head for the last few months. Why? Well, because it seemed like we were making so much headway. We got the Affordable Care Act. We got the Paris Climate Accord. It looked like finally we had found ways to solve really hard problems. And we'd found ways to solve really hard problems in ways that helped everybody. Not just men, but women. Not just white people, but all people. Not just the rich, or the clever, or the pretty, or the lucky, but everybody. And now we're not really sure how permanent those solutions might be. And I suspect there are quite a lot of us feeling temporary about ourselves at the moment. So what are we going to do? We have to start where we are, with the institutions that we work for and in and with, Stand by the overlooked and the undervalued, the poor, the lonely, the isolated, and the vulnerable, and make it clear that they will not lack for champions or defenders. Because if we really believe that all men are created equal in theory, then in practice what we have to do is build organizations in which everybody counts. How do we do that? Some ideas. I used to mentor a senior executive in a big, important company in the United Kingdom. And he came to me one day and he said, Margaret, I've decided I think I'm going to quit. And I said, OK, fair enough, why? And he discovered various ethical breaches in the way that the company treated people. And he said, I don't want to be part of this. I feel ashamed to be part of an organization that treats people like this. And I think he kind of expected me to put my arm around his shoulder and pat him on the back for being such a good ethical guy. But instead, I said, well, but the thing is, Sam, have you tried everything? And he looked kind of startled. And I said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know what I mean. <laughs> but I want you to go home and pick up a pad of paper and a pencil and make a list of what everything would be. So he was a good guy, and he went home, and he did his homework. And I saw him about a month later, and he was looking kind of frisky. And I said, so what happened, Sam? And he said, well, I did what you said. And I, made, I took the pad of paper, and I made my list. And then I looked at it, and I thought, I can do that. So he went to his chairman, and he explained why he was going to leave. And the ethical breach stopped. And he was promoted to chief operating officer. Here was a powerful person inside a big organization who didn't see how much power he had or what he could achieve with a single conversation. We need to have those conversations to create cultures of candor and safety. We also need to speak to the passions that brought people into our organizations in the first place. One of the most interesting people I've had the opportunity to meet in the last year is a fantastic Dutchman, an economist who went into nursing. Not a typical career trajectory. And he realized that nursing had become so bureaucratized and so hierarchical that it wasn't really fun anymore. And he persuaded the Dutch government to fund an experiment. And he created a team of 10 nurses whose only job description was do what's right for the patient. They had their own budget. They could decide where their own offices were. 
and they spent all of their time working together, looking after their patients, comparing notes, finding and inventing new ways to treat the maladies that they saw over and over again. And the consequence of this little experiment was they brought down the cost of nursing by 40%. How? All the patients got better 40% faster. And this organization now dominates the Dutch healthcare economy. Why did he do it? He said, because nobody cares about the status or the administration or the detailed description of each job. What they care about is their patients. And all I did was give them the freedom to express their passion. We need to bring the passion back for everybody that works with us. And we need to see how profoundly they all, we all, get trapped on the square of the chessboard in which we reside. The best way I've ever seen this was talking to some people at Roche who decided to try another great experiment, which is they surfaced all the hard, hard problems that they'd been struggling with and defeated by over the last 25 years, and they published them to the entire community, not just the research community. And quite a few of them got solved. But then they took the same problems and they put them on Innocentive, an open innovation platform, and more of them got solved. And the thing that's so interesting about Innocentive is that you see there routinely that people solve problems well outside their expertise domain. One researcher looking for a biomarker for Lou Gehrig's disease found his problem solved by a plant biologist. It wasn't a plant problem but a plant biologist found the way to the answer. Another researcher trying to figure out better ways to clear up oil spills had his challenge solved by a cement engineer. It wasn't a cement problem, but the way the cement engineer thought about it identified a different way to think about it. This happens all the time on open innovation platforms because people with different expertise and different experience can think about problems in a different way. And it shows how much more creativity and innovation we could get from people if we realized that they all have contributions that they can make. And while we're at it, why don't we do diversity as if we really meant it? We've had 30 years of gigantic, expensive diversity programs that haven't budged the needle a hair. Instead, why don't we, each of us, decide today that we are going to look for and find and nurture and coach and develop a successor for ourselves who does not look like us? that we are going to have conversations about our differences because it's our differences that are our gift to each other. That instead of spending time finding all the things we have in common, we should spend time exploring the differences from which we can learn. Do all these sound a little small? They do to me. But the truth is, we all inhabit complex systems. And what we know now is that complex systems don't respond very well to gigantic battleship change programs. They respond very well to lots and lots of little experiments. One tiny one in the National Health Service in the UK demolished the hierarchy between doctors and patients when somebody realized that doctors tended to walk up to patients and just start talking at them. And so they said, why don't we try something really simple? How about every conversation has to start with, hello, <laughs> hello, my name is Margaret. Hello, my name is Bill. Hello, my name is Gareth. To get the conversation not from expert to specimen, but person to person. What all of these things do, these small things, 
is they build social capital, the norms of reciprocity, generosity, and trust that allow people to bring all of their capacity to work, all of their passion to work. What social capital does is it creates a culture in which everybody cares about each other because they recognize that everybody matters. It's very tempting at this moment in our history to give way to the indulgence of pessimism to, or to bury ourselves in the busyness of urgent work and pretend that really everything's fine and maybe, maybe there's nothing we really need to worry about. But if we have values, they are tested at their greatest in times of difficulty. And it is in those hard times that we find out who we really are and where the greatness of the people around us truly resides. The truth is that we have very big challenges in front of us right now. But I don't believe we can do nothing, that we need feel helpless. We are the most experienced, educated, healthy, and connected people in history. It cannot be that we have nothing with which to defend against the forces of nationalism and racism and misogyny and deceit. It cannot be that we have neither power nor resources with which to protect and defend the weak and the poor. At the least and to the last, we have got to stand by the vulnerable and the isolated because we believe that everybody counts. The contingencies of history recede so fast, it's often hard to remember the norms of the past, a time when things that we take for granted today were inconceivable then. But in my lifetime, in this city, all the hospitals, bar one, refused to accept any patient suspected of suffering from AIDS. And now we have gay rights and gay marriage. In my lifetime, I marched on anti-war protests. I watched civil rights protests in the street. Vietnam was a byword for violence and despair, and yet it is a place you can go to today with a vibrant economy and where you can be guaranteed a warm welcome. We can achieve all of these things, these enormous changes, because norms don't change because of a single policy or a great person or a miraculous event. Norms change through the concatenation of small things, the meetings you call, the votes you cast, the questions you, are, you, you ask, the conversations that you have, the arguments that you persist with, the friendships and the partnerships that you develop over time. We have freedom. And the only thing that will take it from us is our inability to see that we have it now. The world is changed when people with freedom know how to use it. 77 years ago, W.H. Auden, a great British poet, sat in New York confronting many of the same issues that confront us today. And this is what he wrote. Defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies. Yet dotted everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I composed like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show 
an affirming flame.